Good afternoon. Welcome to this Monday's meeting of the Columbia Rotary Club. Uh, Rusty DePass is going to lead us in the piano with the National Anthem. to keep us under the spell of immortality. May we never again think and act as, you, as if you were dead. Let us more and more come to know you as a living Lord who has promised to all that believe, because I live, ye shall live also. Help us remember that we are praying to you, the conqueror of death, so we may no longer be afraid nor be dismayed by the world's problems and threats since you have overcome the world. In your strong name we ask for your living presence and your victorious power. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. You may be seated. Uh, Jonathan Milling is going to come up to welcome our visiting Rotarians and guests. Uh, while Jonathan's on his way up here, everybody just take a moment and remember the car bucket. Uh, the car bucket is a blue bucket on the center of the table. Those funds go to aid our all-time research, community spirit change, or uh, dollar bills. Thank you. Field and then we'll welcome our busy Rotarians uh, after Health and Happiness. I hate to have these people coming in late and miss this, quite frankly. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me say something to you about Health and Happiness just in general for a minute. Because uh, a lot of you don't really realize this, but I've got it, you know it because I've begged you for some stuff. All right? I mean, the, 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 true, the true purpose of Health and Happiness to talk about the club members, the goods, the bad, to share these type of things. There, there could be things going on in people's lives that individually a lot of us wouldn't know anything about, but collectively somebody in here has been through that and we certainly could help each other. Now having said that, you'll see that I begged and you'll see what I got, you'll see what you can say. Number one, don't forget next week's the golf tournament. I think you're going to hear more about that. Number two, a lot of you may not know Bob Rogers. Bob's an older member, been with us for a long time, had a heart attack last summer. David Dungeness was telling me that he hadn't been back. And, and may not be back, and I wish you'd just keep him in your prayers. David has offered to bring him, but uh, uh, he just doesn't feel like coming at this time. Uh, George Simmons, who all of you know, or should know, George Simmons is recovering from having a heart valve installed uh, last Thursday, so certainly keep him in your prayers. Uh, Jim, Co I, is Jim Covington here? I don't know if he is or not, but Jim, as I was leaving last week, Jim was telling me, he said, I just... Celebrated my 60th wedding anniversary. My birthday was last week, and he's been in Rotary for over 40 years in this club. Wow. That maybe when he's here, we can we can recognize him again. Uh, you know, and we don't talk much about how long people have been in Rotary. We we talk a lot sometimes about those people that have continuous service for 20 years or 30 years, or 40, but we never talk about how long they've been in it. The last time we did a lot of that was when Jim Reynolds' father was here, and he had over 50 years of perfect attendance. But we right now in this club. I know about 12 people have been here over 40 years and about three people that have been members of this club for over 50 years. And I'm going to talk to John about some way we might can, can recognize them as well. 
Uh, I mentioned to uh, Hal Stevenson about anything going on. He said, yeah, his daughter's coming out with a new book, so stay tuned. You'll hear more about that. Uh, Jack Huff was a participant in Holy Week last week. Uh, Lee Michael just told me that he got reelected as vice chair of the uh, board of trustees of College of Charleston, so he certainly wanted to congratulate him. Uh, and then for several weeks, oh, and by the way, where's Rusty? Rusty, oh, you're standing up. Look, look at Rusty. Now, I was asking for help and happiness, and he's got a cane as he walked in, and he said some story about his dog ran into him full speed. Is that true, Rusty? <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, you, you might remember from a few weeks back, we talked about, several people have talked about the Governor's Prayer Conference. A lot of you were there, a lot of you participated. Matter of fact, uh, Holt Chetwood was our Master of Ceremonies, and, and as I said, a lot of you here, Glenn Ward was our speaker at the last minute, because for the first time in 55 years, we had a speaker over the weekend that had a conflict come up that couldn't come in, so we had Glenn speak. I want you to know that I've been involved with this for a long time, but it is a consensus among that group that we have never had a better speaker than what Glenn Ward did. He's sitting back there. Right there. <laughs> it was humorous, it was entertaining, but it had value. And it was a lot about the values of life. The governor, seated next to him, laughed the heart, she had tears coming out of her eyes. And sent him a personal thank you, which I think is a real credit to the job that you did, and we appreciate that more than you know. Uh, Another thing, too, and, and maybe we can put this out there, but we, we, I want everybody to be able to hear Glenn's talk, and we have it. We have the audio of that talk. We don't have the video, but we have just still pictures of the audio. And between now and next week, I'm going to get worthy on how you can get that so you can hear it. I think, I think you truly will enjoy that. Uh, and the other thing that we'll get back to you on is we had, uh, I don't mind telling you, I don't think Frank mind, Frank Brown brought a couple tickets to leadership that he's not going to be able to use, and he's donated those, and we're trying to figure out some unique way to figure out who to give them to. I, I think we'll tie it. Uh, to membership or a guest or something, but we'll do that within the next week as well. All right, let me uh, let me share a couple things with you and uh, get on to the better part of our program we got over here. Uh, I don't I don't remember exactly, but I think if, if my memory serves me halfway correct, that Billy Graham is about 96 years old and suffering from Parkinson's disease, which he has for for quite some time. Uh, but back in uh, I think it was the year 2000, a group of community leaders in Charlotte went to him and said. We'd like you to come to a luncheon so that you, our favorite son, could be honored. And Billy Graham said, uh, he really was a little hesitant because of his Parkinson's disease. He said, don't misunderstand, we don't want you to make a speech. We just want you to be there so we can honor you. So he agreed to do that. And as he walked to the podium, a lot of nice things have been said about him. And he said, you know, he said, this really reminds me of Albert Einstein. And he said, years ago, Albert Einstein was on a train leaving Princeton. And the conductor came by to punch his ticket, and when he got there, Einstein reached in his vest pocket, his ticket wasn't there, and he reached in his coat pocket, and it wasn't there, and he reached in his trousers, it wasn't there, he looked in his briefcase, and it wasn't there either. And uh, the conductor said, don't worry about it, I know who you are, we all know who you are, we know you're paid, we're not worried about it. Einstein uh, showed a profound appreciation, I guess, with his smile, the conductor went on down the aisle. Well, before the conductor went to the next car, he looked back and he saw Einstein down on his hands and knees, obviously looking for his ticket. And he went back and he said, Dr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, you don't need to look for your ticket. We know who you are, you don't need it. Einstein said, I too know who I am, but I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> and, he, and he said, I need that ticket. <laughs> Having said that, he said, see the suit I'm wearing? He said, it's a new suit. He said, my children told me I was getting a little slovenly and, and not quite as fastidious, fastidious as I used to be. And so I went out and bought this suit. And I bought it for two occasions. I bought it for this talk today, and I also bought it for my funeral when I, when I die. I'm going to wear that. But I don't want you thinking about this suit when you hear that I died. What I want you thinking about is I do know who I am, and I do know where I'm going. And the thing you need to think about is do you know where you're going so you can get your ticket punched? Now, one more thing along that same line that I'll, I'll share with you. I had somebody print this out. It would print on one page, but they used some kind of 16 fonts or something. It took about 11 pages. Thank God I don't have to read it. Uh, but this is a, an interesting perspective that you probably never looked at. And the author of this is it, really not known. This, this happens to be something that was found in, they used to say Bill Bowl, and they I think they said Wallet, of Paul Bear Bryant when he died in 19, or after he died in, in 1932. And it's called the magic bank account. Imagine that you won the following prize. 
in a contest. Each point in your bank with deposit is $86,400 into your account. And they'd agree to do that every day. But there was a set of rules with it. So if they did that, everything you didn't spend on that day would be taken back. You can't simply transfer the money to another account. You have to spend it. Each morning upon awakening, the bank opens your account with another $86,400 for that day. But here's the last rule. The bank can end it anytime they want to. They can say, game over. That's it. What you didn't spend, you obviously would lose. What would you do? Well, you'd probably go out and buy anything and everything for yourself or your family or people you didn't even know because you could never spend that kind of money, I don't think. Some wives could. But no, you really couldn't spend that kind of money. Uh, but you try to spend it. And, and, and matter of fact, it's said that the reason you try to spend it, obviously because it's going to be depleted every day. Well, this is not just a game. It's, it's a real game. This is a real, true thing. Each of us is already a winner of this prize. We just can't seem to get grasp of the fact that the prize is time. Every morning we awaken to receive 86,400 seconds as God's gift of life. And when we go to sleep at night, any remaining time, it's not credited back to us. What we haven't used up that day is forever lost. Yesterday's forever gone. Each morning the account is refilled, but the bank can't dissolve your account at any time without warning. So what do you do with your 86,400 seconds? These seconds are worth a lot more than what the money would be. Think about it and remember to enjoy every second of your life because time races by a lot faster than you realize. Take care of yourself, be happy, love deeply, enjoy life, and have a great day. Don't, uh, don't worry and fret about the fact that uh, if you're, if you're as old as you are. There's other people that would love to have had that opportunity. Thank you. Well, everyone, happy Easter Monday. Don't believe we've got any uh, visiting uh, Rotarians here today with us, but if I could get anyone who's got a, a guest, please stand. Hello, I'm Mark Sullivan. I have as my guest. I have as my guest today Rebecca Goings. She's the uh, wife of Robert and works for Judge Williams as an attorney and law clerk. Rebecca Gilkins. Uh, Jim Morris, I have as my uh, two guests, my two sons, both uh, went to AC Florida, one went to uh, Furman, um, and both of them lived up in, both of them work now up in Manhattan. I've managed to get one of them to come back here, and so he works, uh, and he works as a distance uh, working relationship. He's in the um, network security business, Andrew here to my right, and his brother Roe uh, works for SWIFT, which is, uh, if you ever know what SWIFT codes were, um, it's a banking technology company. Welcome to all um, guests. Y'all have a great week. Uh, our next, uh, Carl is going to come up and talk to us about the golf tournament next week. It's going to be a Windermere on Monday. Uh, we will not be having our regular scheduled meeting in place at the golf tournament. pretty good on a 10-day forecast. Uh, Monday looks pretty good in the moment. So uh, we hope that uh, all of you will come out and enjoy just being out there for some fun and some fellowship. Again, it's a great opportunity to meet some of your fellow Rotarians, to invite a guest, and just spend some time outside of the uh, meeting rooms. Uh, with regard to those who haven't signed up that might be interested, can we have a show of hands? They're not so great. Um, so Jerry has the list. Jerry Smith, raise your hand there. So for those of you who haven't signed up, there's still a chance. Of course, we owe when we are head camp somewhere toward uh, Thursday of this week. Um, we have a putting contest that starts at 10.30. And those of you who come and done that, I know you enjoy that. Um, those of you who haven't, it's a lot of fun. 
Uh, we also have a great buffet lunch, so come out and enjoy that even if you're not playing. And dinner, 5.30 or 6 o'clock, if you're not playing, please consider that as another option to come out and have some fellowship. So with that, um, I would say that some of you have asked for an opportunity to uh, sponsor a whole. We didn't promote that a lot, but we welcome all the opportunities. We have our lovely uh, whole sponsor sign model, Ms. Meredith Gannon. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So um, please consider that as well. So you can contact me. The sign-up sheets are on your desk with the information. I think they're out there. If, if not, they're... Uh, uh, we'll have some at the table that you can pick up that have directions and uh, contact information. So we look forward to seeing you all out there uh, next Monday. All right. Thank you, Carl. He and his committee do a great job every year putting that event on for us. Uh, John Bakus is gracious enough to host that event out of Windermere each spring. And uh, John at the last minute secured tickets to the final four, so when you do get to see him, uh, ask him about that experience. Uh, Neil Coyle wanted me to pass on that the Scholarship Selection Committee will meet by the piano immediately after the meeting. So that committee sat through two days of interviews a couple of weeks ago uh, to select two, two graduating seniors for um, the recent college scholarships we'll give out this spring. Uh, but they'll meet to finalize their selection process have two candidates and then we will present those to the club. Um, the leadership of the club is pleased to announce that our leader cast event, which will be our primary fundraiser to fund those scholarships, sold 377 tickets during the early bird um, pricing that we had that expired last week. Um, so that exceeded the expectations of the committee. Um, we're very appreciative of everyone in the club who chipped in and uh, participated and will attend that event. Um, I would like to turn it over to Robert Goins to introduce our program. Thank you, President. Um, the judiciary is a vitally important branch of government, and we, when we talk about the needs of our state, oftentimes the business of our courts are often overlooked. Um, as some of us um, really appreciate, um, it is the court system that is um, vital for the rule of law and to provide the orderly society that we have um, and our ability to, um, to live here in America um, with the freedoms that we've been given. Judge H. Bruce Williams was born, raised, and resides in Columbia. He's um, well known by many of us here today. and He has served our state um, as a judge for the last two decades. Judge Williams was first elected as a family court judge for the Fifth Judicial Circuit in 1995. He also helped establish and presides over the Richland County Ju um, Juvenile Drug Court. Since its, its inception in January of 1997, Judge Williams was elected to the South Carolina Court of Appeals in May of 2004. Court of Appeals is our second highest court in South Carolina. He's considered by many as a foremost jurist in our state, and we're so very proud to have him here today. And it is by no mistake that he is a proud and fine Wofford graduate. Uh, <laughs> I give you congratulations. Thank you. It's a, a pleasure to be with you. It, it is. And uh, this brings back lots of memories that I used to be meetings in this uh, same building years ago. I was a Kalanian for lots of years uh, and, and in doing that what I noticed when I walked in the door the fried chicken is the same. <laughs> it's, the salad is the same. No, this is really good. I'm not being critical of it, you understand, but it is it is the same. Uh, Mr. Hahn, who some of you might know, Ed Hahn was the owner of a small business here, Hahn Laboratories, and he always kidded. He just said, I'm just not sure what pieces of chicken these really are. It's just it's like the, he just called the orange bird cut and he just didn't know. It's just something that was his thing. Uh, but it brought back great memories. And part was Kiwanis. And like you, with Rotary and, and your dedication and your sense of community and what you do, uh, and that is makes it a pleasure to be here and spend time with you. A couple things I want to talk about today. 
One is, and I have to mention this, when I walked in, I saw uh, Reese Williams, and he was talking about, I told him I was talking to him about lawyers and what we do and the court system and what we do, and he said, say something, good. Well, the truth is, that's really easy to do, because I think there are so many things that we do that are good, that is right, we can always do better, but we do lots of good things. And I'm going to talk about some of those things today. I'm fortunate to be here today. One, and Robert was kind enough to invite me, but the way I got to know Robert is through Rebecca. And the way I got to know Rebecca was through my connection again back to Kiwanis and Key Club. I was a Key Club sponsor for a lot of years at my old high school, Columbia High. And you all may know a young man named Craig Melvin, uh, who you see now on the Today Show. Well, Craig is an old Columbia High School Key Clubber who I had the pleasure to meet and work with for a number of years before he went on to Walker College. Uh, and then off to the newscast here and then to DC and now in New York we get to watch him on the Today Show. But I am interviewing law clerks probably in my second year on the Court of Appeals and Craig calls. Judge, I hear you interviewing law clerks. I am. I've narrowed it down to two. Well, I have this friend. I do you? I do. Uh, and, and she is the fiance of my best buddy from Walford. And I said, Craig, you, you saw my problem. I narrowed it down to two. Uh, Rebecca is one of the two. Uh, we're, we're all good. Decisions made. So that's how I got to know Robert and Rebecca. And I got to tell you, Rebecca's been with me uh, since then, and it's been terrific. And part of that is, again, what I talk about, I talk about good young lawyers in this room today. There are lots of terrific older lawyers, and there are lots of great young lawyers sitting here. And I've been able to see that in what I get to do uh, in the family court when I was there and now in the Court of Appeals. I did not have a law clerk in the family court. I do now. That's probably the best part of my job, of meeting and working with all these smart young lawyers uh, and, and the efforts trying to get things right when we're working on cases in the Court of Appeals. First, I'm going to talk about what lawyers do, and I think some contributions that they've made. Clearly, historically, you, you see lots of the contributions lawyers have made, and we see that in public life and things they've done. But at the same time, I, I do think it's important to be engaged in your community and what you what you contribute in your community. And, and looking at that, I started looking at young lawyers, and particularly around Columbia, but around the state, doing the, sort of the same things. And do you know that we have lawyers who have gotten engaged and are preparing wheel, wills free of charge for uh, heroes, those first responders out there across the state, those who are going off to serve our country in foreign lands, and lawyers are, have created programs to do wills for free. They have initiated those programs on their own across the state. It's been a great success. Lawyers giving back to the community, because that's one thing lawyers should understand uh, and must continue to understand our, our, our responsibility to contribute to our community. Uh, lawyers here in Columbia working with the Special Olympics. You know, you have this sense of community. You're, you're here, you're a member of this club. The things you do, you know how important that is. So you do it on a volunteer basis, but gosh, if you can do it as part of your profession, even greater. And that's what some young lawyers are doing here and all across the state. The Cinderella Project, the uh, lawyers across the state who are helping gather prom dresses for young people who maybe can't afford those things. Gathering prom dresses, jewelry, again, making contributions. And Mr. Williams, like you say, these lawyers doing these things, they're making contributions day in and day out. They've come up with some neat ideas and they're doing it. Young lawyers out there advocating for youth homeless and, and in the sense of trying to help those young people who are homeless and who have special needs and trying to get things they need so that that will end and they will be successful and be able to contribute uh, to our community. The backpack drives when we are, the um, lawyers gathering school supplies, we know that. We see that, that's advertised right now. Again, something else lawyers are doing. Families Forever Committee. Young lawyers got together, what else can we do? Let's educate the public about adoptions and available children and families. <coughs> what can we do to help grow and improve those things? Lawyers are doing that, and this is on their time. How about volunteer income tax preparation for those who can't afford to go out and hire someone who needs help doing that? How about volunteers who are out, Voices Against Violence, uh, collecting necessities for those who may have been engaged in uh, violence in the home and problems that, arise, that arises from that. 
they were out there doing that. The Bar Foundation giving over $1.9 million to issues related to solving domestic abuse problems, homeless justice project, YMCA youth and government, and just leadership of young people in high schools and middle schools around the state. So I think that lawyers are out contributing a great deal and encourage them to do so. I think that's how we all know the community improves, just like what you do in your service, your service in your church and wherever it might be. The other thing you don't see lawyers do that I'll tell you about is the thousands and thousands of hours that lawyers spend in DSS cases. DSS, you've been reading about DSS in, probably in recent months and issues there and problems there. One thing that folks don't realize is that lawyers are appointed in these cases, uh, in lots of these cases, and spend just across the state, who would be in the thousands of hours. I was talking to a friend not long ago who remembered my days in the family court, and he was reminding me, he said, Bruce, I just finished the DSS case I started. I said, well, how long have you been doing it? He said, 18 years. He started when the baby was born, and he goes to hearings every year, kept up. And I gotta tell you folks, over the years, especially in family court, I got to see just what wonderful people can do. I saw a lot of really good lawyers do a great job advocating for children and young people in the courtroom. As a result of that, just like this lawyer did, in the end, hopefully, and I think in his eyes, what he saw was that young person being successful, going out, being independent, and will have a good life. That lawyer was doing that on his time. That, the appointed cases, so you understand, those are part of the lawyer's obligation. So lawyers have to do certain things because it's an obligation as a lawyer. The other thing is the thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of pro bono work, um, of just volunteering to go out and do the things I'm talking about that I mentioned to you earlier. So lawyers do lots and lots of good things. I think what you see in those, those aren't the things you're going to hear about. No one's put those in the newspaper, uh, but they're there. This is someone, individuals, doing their job or either volunteering just like you do and you decide you want to make a little difference. They're making a difference in someone's life. It's not going to be on the front page of the paper. But I'll tell you that some of the good things that happen in the DSS cases, and I'll never forget the first time, that's probably my first year on the bench, I was in a small community. It was the first time I was able to give children back to a mother who had lost them because of her drug use. And I hadn't done that before, and it was just, a, for me, the first time experience. I'd taken children away. I'd said to parents, you can't have your children back. But it's the first time I was returning children back to the mother. And what had happened, the mother had, had, uh, had done the things she needed to do. And I was able to say, ma'am, returning your children to you today. And you know the first thing she did? This doesn't happen often. She hugged her lawyer. You know, you don't get many hugs as a lawyer in the courtroom. <laughs> <laughs> but that day, she did. Her lawyer, the lawyer, she did such a terrific job. She went above and beyond the call of duty. She made certain that that person got to where she needed to get her treatment, helped her find a job, made certain she was there, doing the things she needed to do. And I gotta tell you, as a result of that effort, that was a great contribution that no one will ever read about in the newspaper that made a difference in that mother coming back in, in uh, the court and then going home with her children that day. And I did go back and check later because you always wonder how they're doing after the return. And that's one of those that just interested me, so I called and checked. And they're doing great. The lawyer made the contribution and made the difference, going the extra mile to do that. So, I tell you, I think I hope I've accomplished that, Reese, that I have said just a few things that I planned out before you got here. I might give you a hug, Judge. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. You don't have any cases before us, that's okay. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not being, I don't mean to, to beat the drums just for lawyers. The truth is, y'all want to talk about this, and that's what they ask me. Talk about the lawyers and the courts, and I'm about to talk about some business of the courts, too. But at the same time, with you all, we focus so many, so many of the bad things in life, we just forget the good things. You know, you all up here a moment ago, Mr. Crutchfield, he's talking about the good things. And we just don't do enough of that. We don't recall as looking at what each of us do and our contributions in our community. And it's good sometimes stopping to do that. You all do that when you come in here. So I try to do that, that a little bit with, with the lawyers. 
I do want to talk a few minutes, though, about the, the courts and what, what is going on. And the title that Robert mentioned was the business of the courts and what courts do. And I'm going to talk about the different courts we have, some things that are going on in the courts that maybe you haven't heard of, heard about. And I hope that you will see that the courts are trying to make a difference, to, to continue to evolve, to be creative in trying to solve the people's problems. We work for you. I work for the people. That's, that's what we do. We're trying to find solutions and help resolve issues. So the, what we've got, just looking at what the courts might do, Supreme Court, for example, issued, and again, because of our new computer system, I think all these accurates are pretty, pretty accurate, these, these, these estimates, but it's a new computer system. But So I, I qualify this a little bit just because they're, they're trying to figure out a few things about it. But the Supreme Court, for example, issued a couple of hundred, 200 opinions. Um, they reviewed hundreds more in determining which cases to hear. So you will hear the Court of Appeals, we may have issued more opinions and looked at more. We don't get to pick and choose. We get to hear everything that comes to us. The Supreme Court, they have the, the, uh, what they do is look and see. One, if they think we made a mistake, they're quick to correct us, which we always appreciate, uh, especially me. Uh, so they'll, they're quick to correct us, but at the same time, they will choose the cases they hear. So that's why the numbers are a little different in that regard. Uh, they heard some 2,600 motions that relate to these cases. And understand, there are five of them now. So they're hearing these motions, and you have some staff attorneys who are helping others who help do this. But just think about this volume of cases when, you, when I go through some of these numbers and what which the court system is doing in, um, in trying to resolve these issues. So 200 of these, um, I think 140 of those are published opinions, and we have something called unpublished opinions that maybe it's not something new, but it's, a little, it's, it's still an opinion that's put, put out there. You can find it, but it, it uh, has a different impact on things. But again, 2,600 motions. What the court also does, the Supreme Court also does, is deal with the rules. They deal with matters relating to the profession, deal with the bar exam, and a huge emphasis on mentoring and professionalism. Um, that is, I guess, in recent years, professionalism amongst lawyers, the mentoring program to help young lawyers as they begin careers, to help law students, that is the focus of the court, and it is a good focus. I teach a class at the law school in the springtime, and I get to see uh, the students there that, uh, who are part of those mentoring programs, and it clearly is making a difference, trying to help the future lawyers understand what it's like to be a lawyer, and uh, the importance of it and your responsibilities uh, as a lawyer. Our court, there are nine of us, there are nine of us. We issued over 700 opinions of those 160 were published and the others in the unpublished category. We had about 5,000 motions that came through our court that impact those cases. Uh, and again, we have help doing that with some of our staff lawyers, but just so you understand, that's sort of the volume that comes through the court. Um, a few types of cases go straight to the Supreme Court. Some we don't hear, we can't, like death penalty cases, for example. They go straight to the Supreme Court. We hear murder cases, but not the death penalty cases, or the murder cases involved, the death penalty. They go straight to the Supreme Court. So there's a few unique things that have to go to the Supreme Court. So those are a few numbers that, that uh, the courts deal with, at least on the appellate level. On the trial court level, a little difference. There are or were 110,000 criminal cases that were filed across the state. Now, and then 95,000 civil cases. There are a little over 50 judges who will deal with those 200,000 cases. That's a lot of work. <clears throat> That's a lot of work. Uh, approximately the average it out 4,000 cases per judge to resolve. Understand one of the things the Chief Justice will say uh, on occasion is that we have the fewest number of judges and the highest case load in the country. But we are still able to resolve it and try to do it in a timely fashion and in a good fashion. In family court, there's some 65,000 cases filed, plus the juvenile cases that come through there. And so you understand in family court is, you know, divorce cases, which you understand, the Department of Social Services cases, the termination of rights in cases related to abuse and neglect, child support, attorney, adoption, uh, again, all the juvenile cases. Uh, um, so you've got, again, that huge number of cases, and again, a little over 50 judges in the family court dealing with those matters. I haven't mentioned to you magistrate court and city courts, so if you wonder the import, importance of courts and what they do, the difference they make, and the importance of the people who are there trying to resolve them in the correct fashion, those are numbers. Just, 
just a large number. <clears throat> to deal with this, though, I would share with you that the courts just doesn't, it's just not been sitting by and trying to do things the same old way. Now, I understand, I'm going to tell you at some point, I think some of the things ought to be done the same old way. <clears throat> because one thing I've learned, especially in family court, is the most important thing I ever saw is people appreciate if you take the time and listen to what they say. Family court, we didn't have a jury. So the judge was the jury and the judge. But I've ne I never had someone complain because I took too much time to listen to them, to care about their case. So they understood that I wanted to do the right thing. I wanted to get it right. And what every judge in the state should be and hopefully is doing is trying to let litigants know, at least by what they do and say in the courtroom, that that's important to each one of them. That's what we're trying to accomplish. At the same time, we're trying to be creative. The old way, I think, you're never going to get past that personal touch when you get to court. Your experience in the courtroom, you're going to remember, remember forever because you don't go there very often. But other things that we've done, and I guess the Chief Justice has been very creative in leading the effort to accomplish much of this, uh, are business courts in particular. I saw Steve Ham earlier, and I know he was involved in some of this, and in a lot of the publicity, and it's been in articles in the newspaper, that, that the, the business courts, and, and trying to respond to the um, sense that cases are resolved in a timely fashion, that's important to business. Of course, that's important to everyone. That's why we've done some other things, too. So we're not just focused on one area. We're trying to get things heard in a timely fashion for everyone. But the business courts, the idea is that when there are complex business decisions, there will be some specialized procedures, some specialized case management, so the cases can be resolved. And that was one of the attractions to business coming to our state, is the fact that our courts have gotten creative trying to look at things that, that will help resolve issues that somehow just won't be sitting out there for years and years and years and not getting hurt. Other things that have been done, fast-track jury trials for simple cases, or more the simpler cases anyway, that can be heard in a day, and there's some special rules for those. But again, trying something new, something innovative, to help people resolve problems. Because ultimately that is about this, whether it's business to business or individuals, it is about resolving folks' problems and helping them move on. You know what the alternative to the court system is, don't you? It's not good. If you go back a little bit and you think about how we used to resolve problems back in the old Wild West days, and, and that wasn't, that's not the way to do things. <laughs> this is better. It's what makes us so unique. It is, so, it is what makes us so unique in this world because of what we did. It may not be perfect, but it is still the best thing in this world. It, there's nothing that can compete with this as to the quality of what we do and how we do it. Uh, in South Carolina in particular, the good news for me is I got to travel the country a little bit when I went on the Court of Appeals. And I go and compare what we did. We do things so much better in so many other states that you should be proud of that. We just do. And I've seen it, and you go talk to it, uh, talk to others about their, their process and how they do things. We do things the right way. The good news is we want to do them even better, and we're looking at ways to do that. The other thing we're doing, alternate dispute resolution through mediation, arbitration, again, to speed the process along. Uh, try it will also help save money and, and, and so you've got some other things, lots of new and creative ideas out there that are being used in our court system to, to again help resolve problems. The last thing I'm going to talk to you, last few things I'm going to talk to you about, one is near and dear to me because of, of my interest in, in alternative courts. Um, it is one in particular is drug court which you heard Robert mention. I went on the family court bench. We were looking at ways to deal with juveniles and unique problems they have, in particular juveniles with drug problems. And I'm one of those who still thinks we have a very severe problem with, with uh, drug problems in our, our culture and our young people. And I guess I see it. I don't see it as often because I'm not in family court as, as on a day in, day out basis like I used to be. But what I see doing my juvenile drug court, I, I do have great concern that that is still a huge issue for us. But South Carolina, again, we have gotten <coughs> creative. We have gotten uh, started drug courts in South Carolina. And these are courts that are for young people and adults who have very serious drug problems. They're either addicts or chemically addicted, uh, chem chemically dependent. And as a result, they commit a crime. So it could be a non-drug related crime, it could be shoplifting, it could be anything but a non-violent crime. It's not for violent offenders. It's for people who have very serious drug problems, and that's why they got in trouble. 
The idea is to keep them home, not to send them to jail. Ends up, it does a couple of things. One, it works. Two, it saves money. For us, and especially the juveniles, we're trying to help the family resolve lots of issues because the family has broken down as a result of a lot of these things. So the young people who, in my drug court, are with me nine to 15 months. Some have stayed as long as two years. And understand, the best thing I've ever done as a judge is, is night court. This is, I, do, I do it on Monday nights. That's where I'll be tonight. We have night court. It is my best job as a judge, my nine paying job. It is, it is working with these young people in drug court on Monday nights. Uh, there were four of us originally who started drug courts. There are two of us who still who are engaged in it. But they've grown now to 30 plus across the state. Every circuit has drug courts. There are adult drug courts, juvenile drug courts. There are veterans drug courts. And you've heard more about that in recent times. Because of issues veterans having returning from, from the Middle East, we have gotten engaged in more and more drug courts for veterans and seen the need there. The other thing you've seen, mental health courts. Unique. Unique in the sense that um, folks with mental health problems have some unique problems that these courts will address versus the same old way of coming into court and you don't have the expertise, you don't have the, the, what you need, and there's, uh, again, experts who are working with those folks with those special problems. Truancy courts, it is what it is, dealing with young people in truancy. Homeless courts, special issues relate to them. Um, and probably the big trend across the country now are DUI courts. There's some thought of the traditional method of dealing with DUIs and those issues. Uh, we continue to have problems and there has been great success with DUI courts across the country, so we'll see. That's not something that we've gotten engaged in. I think Solicitor John in Richland County may be working on uh, starting one of those. But these alternative courts are, have been successful. They save money. I'll give you an example with uh, if a young person was sent to the Department of Juvenile Justice, depending on the numbers, back in the day they said 50000 now here 100000 a year if a young person went to the Department of Juvenile Justice. Well, someone in drug court, eight to 10000 a year. Saves a lot of money. The best story is that such success rate's good. It is better than the alternative. It's better than being incarcerated. It's better than regular probation because the intensity, because on Monday nights they're coming to court. And if they're doing good, we're going to tell them that. If they're doing bad, I'm going to lock you up tonight, but I'll see you next Monday night. And you come back next week and you test positive, I'm going to lock you up tonight, maybe a little longer, but I'll see you next Monday night. So there's that immediacy to doing all this, that response. That they, that they see. Same with the adults. I did the adult drug court for three years and was family court judge too. Adults think different. You know, children are invincible. You got, you got teenagers, you understand that. Uh, but with the adults, a little bit, a little bit different as to how you deal with those. You know, the adults are easier than dealing with the juveniles. Uh, but again, success rates are good. Uh, when I started the first drug court conference I ever went to, there were about four or five hundred people there. The last one I attended was five thousand. They've grown across the country from the few that started back about twenty years, a little over twenty years ago in Florida to now, I think, some 2,500 courts across the country. So again, South Carolina is engaged in looking at these courts. These courts are about accountability and responsibility. When I started this and got engaged in it, uh, the problem was that people thought, well, this is going to be a little too warm and fuzzy. Well, they figured out this isn't about warm and fuzzy. This is about accountability and responsibility and helping these people who are engaged in the, the, with these problems to help learn that. Now it's kind of funny when I deal with uh, drug courts, it went from too warm and fuzzy, now the problem is sometimes getting the defense lawyers to agree because they think drug courts are too hard. It's done a 180 in all these, these 20 years of doing this. Uh, all of a sudden they see what it is, they, don't, they know it's good, but regular probation might be easier versus having to come in and deal with the judge every, every Monday night. Ultimately, it's not the locking up every Monday night. What you see change with the adults and the juveniles, what changes? Just like with you and the folks you know. In the end, it is all positive. It is patting on the back for good things. Most of these young people, these kids, no one has said anything nice to them for years. So even when I lock them up, I'm going to tell them what you did good. But by the way, i got to do this other too. But I'm going to focus on the good too. In the end, that's all they're going to hear is the good. So alternative courts are good. They seem to be working. We're trying to grow them. And we'll continue to watch their success rate to make sure it makes sense to do that, but it appears to be working. It saves money and saving lives. Um, and it's been supported all across the country. I guess one of the last things I saw was 60 Minutes, the Wall Street Journal did a story about in Texas. Uh, they, I think, saved $200 million, closed two prisons. And they were asked why? Drug courts. So it saves money, it's got great success. 
It just makes sense in lots of ways. So, but South Carolina is doing that too. So again, Reese, more, more good news of things courts are being involved in trying to help. The other thing we're doing, and I'll end shortly, is the technology aspect of things. Chief Justice is focused on technology. When I first started on the bench, we had none. Now everything is connected. We, we save time, we save money. We're trying to be efficient, and she's done a wonderful job at inc increasing technology across the state. Uh, in every courthouse, no matter whether it's rural, urban, it is there. It is there. I'll start where I ended. I still think the court, though, is about that personal touch. When you come into the courtroom, when you deal with the judges, it's got to have that part of it. We can do all these other things, and technology is great. But still, when people come to court, there are certain things that they need to feel. They need to, need to know that the judge has that respect for them, that, that there's that respect for their dignity, that we want to see the right thing done. You know, when I went to the Court of Appeals, and I guess the thing was the true family court, you, we didn't have law clerks, so you call your judge friends. What are you trying to do? We're trying to get it right. We really are. Our goal is just to try to get it right. When I sat down with the Court of Appeals the first time with my first panel, was terrific judges. Judge Goolsby has been around for 20 plus years. Ralph King Anderson has been around. Terrific judges with lots and lots of experience. And what I've learned from that panel and every panel, no one has sat down with an agenda. What they've sat down with is the idea of what do we do to get it right? What do we do to get it right? And that's what we're trying to do every day. It has been a pleasure to be with you. Um, and I think if there's any questions, that you have to, if you have any questions, I'll be try to I'll try to answer it. But but um, that's my my take on the business of the courts right now. I think we're working hard to make it better for you. You have none. You got, you got one of the Yes, sir. Not sure if you're in a position to share an opinion on this, but South Carolina's way of electing judges. Good, bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I, I, I like, I have won and I've lost in the system, so I guess I, I can, I have an opinion. But they asked me that screening one time, and that's a public record, so um, it's the, the system. Uh, I think it is, is a good way not to say we can't improve what we do and how we do it. But it, it is a watched other manner uh, of electing judges. I think one of the things you have to be careful of is when money gets involved in, in judges. That's when you read about the election of judges across the country, or you read about judges and lawyers and problems that have arisen. You think about it. I had a friend who ran for the Supreme Court in uh, Texas. I think the first time she ran it cost her a million dollars. The second time she ran it cost her three million dollars for re-election. Uh, when I ran for the Supreme Court, I didn't win, but I ran, and I think it cost me $176. You know, that for postage and stamps, and it's about you going out and your elected representatives making a good decision. And that, that doesn't mean that you all can't be involved in that. So I think the citizens can be involved in the process. The legislature doesn't. So, but I think we're always looking at it. I'm not saying it is the best. Uh, uh, I think it, it is it is good. I, I'm not gonna. The legislature will make that decision as to the best, the best method to elect. Um, but like I said, I won. I've lost. I've seen. I think historically, if you look at the judges across our state, we're very fortunate. We have terrific judges. You go look and see who's there. The history of the judges in this state. I think we compete with anyone in the country. And I, like I said, my basis is when I go see other. Um, go to a CLA, continuing education class or somewhere, and I remember the person sitting behind me, we asked, what are you doing? I'm working on my website. Well, then, well, what do you think? Well, I have to raise money. They're spending time raising money and running for judge. Um, you've got other methods of government appointment, and again, I'm not going to, as you say, I won't, I won't pass on those. I think that we have a system that is shown can work, can be better, can be done a better way. That's for others who have a different kind of vote than I have to decide. Um, but like that. my involvement, so far, and again, I said, I've won, I've lost. But I always feel good about it, not necessarily, but I still think it's a good system overall. Hey, yes, sir. Judge, can you explain to me how in the legal process, when you have a chief justice of an Alabama Supreme Court telling the probate judges to ignore the rulings of the Federal Appeals Court, that they have no jurisdiction, how does that ever get resolved? 
I don't know. I didn't see the answer to that one either. But I'm, I'm pretty sure, best I can tell, that the federal uh, law is going to trump in, in the end is what's going to happen. That's the not, not legal explanation of what's going to happen. We, we've seen that in our history uh, is there, uh, the federal law will ultimately take precedent over the state law and, and and it ultimately gets resolved, I guess, to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. And then it gets into the enforcement of it, how that's done, a uh, whole, whole different issue, but it will get resolved. I mean, if someone can have an opinion, the judge certainly, uh, uh, in his mind, thought he thought that he had a legal basis for that. But when there's a disagreement about that, that's why you have appeals courts and to go and resolve those issues. And ultimately, uh, there's a way that those things will all, always be enforced. Is a mechanism to do it. You still don't go out, like I said, like the old days in the West and resolve problems. There's a way to do it. You use the system. The system will work and it will be resolved. So when there's a disagreement, resolve in an orderly fashion through the courts uh, and through the appropriate courts. Yes, sir. Uh, you spoke uh, in the beginning about the importance of young attorneys, and I've had several friends, uh, young attorneys, who had trouble uh, finding jobs right out of college, and it's kind of been set, stated that maybe the career path is not quite as glamorous, I guess, as it used to be. Um, what do we do about that? I mean, how do you continue to generate great young young lawyers and have the opportunity there? What would you say to somebody having that? I, well, like I said, I teach my, my class at 8 o'clock in the morning on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday in the springtime. And what I tell them is I think things are changing. What we saw with the downturn in the economy, at first it hit the business folks. It just did. And then what happened as a result of that, the business community had to adjust. One of the things they adjusted was how they use lawyers, when they decide to litigate, not litigate. That was the, the cost of doing business. So as a result of that, you ended up um, uh, seeing that downturn. It seems to be leveling off. What you've also seen as a result of that, that may solve itself, or it may help uh, resolve itself as time goes by, is that the number of applicants for law schools um, was far fewer than seats available, which tells you some law schools are hurting. I went to a seminar last year that predicts probably um, 10 law schools in the country will close in the next uh, number of years because of that. If you've got, you know, if there are 3,000 seats and only 2,500 applying, you, you got a couple of things happening. The quality may be impacted, uh, but, but certainly the law schools, if they can't have the students there, they can't fund themselves and that's going to change that dynamic. So I think ultimately you may have fewer lawyers coming out and they will find a balance. But basically what they saw was the result of the economy, business reacted, business included the legal, uh, the, uh, the legal fees or the uh, legal services they had to use. But it appears to be leveling out some now. And I think the theory of these two economists and all four, all four lawyers is that we'll see fewer number of law schools uh, and it will balance itself out. That's the good news for them. And as they always said, there's always room for good lawyers out there. They just are. Um, in this class I'm in, a lot of great young lawyers soon to be sitting there. Um, they've been terrific in class, and I think they'll make great lawyers and they'll find success. Thank you. We have this for you. Uh, in appreciation of your time coming to address us. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. You mentioned twice about the need for the personal touch in the court system and what you've done with the night court on Monday night shows that you walk the wall. So thank you. Uh, President Lett Mark, uh, next two weeks? Yeah, so next week we're going to be at Windermere Golf Club. Come out and join us if you can. Uh, don't want to play golf, come have lunch or dinner with us. And the following Monday, we'll be back at SeaWills on uh, April 20th for Karen Coltrane. Uh, she's the executive director at Adventure. Thank you. Uh, Rusty's past will lead us in our closing with my history.